Welcome to the Startup Grind. All right, Gabe. Welcome. Thank you. So we like to start these interviews. Um, everything with Startup Grind is about the person behind the story, not just what they've done, but also who they are and what made them the person that was able to accomplish these things. So I would love to hear a little bit about where you grew up and your family. Let's start with that. Okay, uh, I grew up in Tucson, oh. so I am uh, one of the very few Arizona natives. Mm -hmm. um, most people kind of come here, and I, I left and then came back, so it's 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 nice to be back. Um, but yeah, I grew up in Tucson. Uh, my parents are my dad's from Brooklyn, and my mom is from Casablanca. So uh, she's she uh, they they made the trek after they got married. They literally uh, got in the car the day after they got married, and and. Uh, basically wanted to put a pin on the map to where they wanted to live. So wow. initially Phoenix was the destination. They took a little day trip to Tucson and uh, thought it was so beautiful that they wanted to end up there. So, Wow, very cool. <clears throat> um, my dad is a uh, successful lawyer in, in Tucson. Um, and I grew up, I've got uh, a brother and two sisters, so I'm the first of four. And, oldest uh, child, that's I pretty common. Oldest, I am the oldest child. Uh -huh. uh, I was the guinea pig. <laughs> and uh, I went to uh, University High School in Tucson, so it's a college prep school. And then um, when I graduated, I went to Tufts University for my freshman year. And then uh, since then, I went, went to the University of Arizona, then University of Redlands, and the story goes on. Do we have any Wildcats fans here? Okay. Oh man, only one oh, person man. nodded. Seriously. <laughs> Tough crowd, good luck. <laughs> All right, um, what did you want to be when you grew up? I didn't really want, I didn't know. Yeah? Um, I, I, I was interested in a lot of things. Um, what kind of things did were you interested in in school, or what did you lean towards? Um, I really liked math a lot in school. Hmm. Um, I did I did very well in math, and to tell you the truth, I really had not a whole lot of interest in, in actual like science, like chemistry, which is funny because that's what I majored in in college. But right? um, uh, when, when, you know, my first experience with, with the sciences, uh, I, you know, it was okay. I didn't really love it. I wasn't really engaged, so. Um, I liked sports. I liked girls. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I liked, you know, the, the things that high school kids like. Right. Very good. What was your first job? Uh, I was a dishwasher at a local restaurant. Um, <laughs> and that lasted for a few months. Um, I wanted to get a car. My dad said, okay, well, you're going to pay for a car. So, dad, um, smart man. Yeah, no, he, he taught me. You know, he, he raised us all with, with very, very good value. So um, that job was uh, my first summer job, which ended abruptly because I almost cut my thumb off on the, uh, on the deli slicer. So um, oh, wow. that was not, it was a good experience, but uh, one that I'd like to not repeat. Could have donated it to a tissue bank <laughs> if you had, right? <laughs> all right, very good. Um, so a little bit about, so I know that you did get a degree in what physiology and chemistry okay mm -hmm. and then out of college you went into sales i did medical device and pharmaceutical mm -hmm. so not many people can kind of play both sides of that fence the detail oriented as well as the friendly salesman why did you kind of fall into the sales side first do you think uh it's a few things because uh, when i first went to school i again didn't really know what i wanted to do um, and I thought I was going to be an economics or a business major, and I quickly found out that I didn't really like that that much either. <laughs> um, so when I was in Boston, I took a sports medicine class, and in that class we got to go to a cadaver lab and we got to learn anatomy and physiology and you know kind of all the stuff that I'm into now. Uh, so from there, when I transferred back, I decided, okay, I'm going to be a doctor, and so uh, did, took all the classes, had all the majors. Um, took the MCATs, started interviewing, and uh, I was interning with uh, an orthopedic surgeon, a local orthopedic surgeon, and uh, he sat me down one day and he said, you know, is this really what you want to do? Is this your calling? And so my best friend and I were, you know, mono and mono studying and, and, and doing things, and um, he's, he's a physician now, but uh, I asked why. He said, well, the, the profession's changed a lot. It's not, not the same thing that you, that, that you think it is. Um, and you know, how soon do you want to start a family? And at that point in time, I really wasn't thinking too hard about that. Mm -hmm. But um, he said, you know, you do understand that you know, you go to medical school and then you go to your residency and then you go to your fellowship and then you get your job. By the time you're done, you're, you know, early to mid 30s. And uh, you know, if you did have children, you know, you're not there for them a lot. Uh, on top of it, it's not quite as glamorous, I guess you could say, a profession. Uh, it's it still is. It's a, it's a it's a noble profession. It's a wonderful profession. But um, managed care has really changed a lot of things. Um, the amount of paperwork, the freedom, and the availability uh, for the surgeons to use the products and uh, do the cases that they want to do 
uh, has been limited tremendously, especially with the local state. So um, he basically told me, he said, you know, do you have a calling from God? And is this really what you want to do? Because it, unless you, if you don't, I think you might want to rethink this. And so, you know, wow. I, I took that with a grain of salt and uh, continued on with what I was doing. So one day we were doing, uh, a, we were, we, I was interning, like I said, and we were doing a total hip case. And uh, there was a guy at the end of the table with uh, a little laser pointer, and he was basically telling the surgeon, hey, you know, you might want to use this size cup, or you might want to, you might want to size that differently, or you might be, your angle might be wrong. And I'm scratching my head going, who's this guy? What's he doing? And uh, after the case, I asked the doc, and he said, uh, that's the Zimmer rep. So, you know, he, he brings all the implants in, and, you know, he's the specialist for that product. Uh, and it really intrigued me. Uh, I think that, I thought that was pretty neat. Uh, and I investigated, you know, what type of education you needed to get into that job, and uh, I'd already had it. So that, that, that was uh, check one. Um, yes. And, you know, what type of training that there was, and uh, the companies offered really extensive training. So uh, it's something that I could get into. Um, that being said, they're not very easy jobs to get. I'm so sure. once, yeah. once I graduated, I had a mission. Uh, and the mission was I would get a pharmaceutical or medical sales job within 12 months. In the meantime, I'd have another job, obviously. But uh, mm -hmm. my dad said I'd have to go to medical school if I, if I didn't get the job within 12 months. <laughs> That's a threat. <laughs> well, no, it was, it, it, well, he was not happy when I decided not to go. Yeah. So... Um, that's exactly what I did. As soon as I graduated, I moved to San Diego and uh, got a job there, but paid the rent. And in the meantime, I was looking for a pharmaceutical job. And you know, to get a pharmaceutical job, you need to have some sort of sales experience, um, which is very new to me. It's true. And so um, I got a sales job out there with uh, it was AirTouch, <laughs> which is now Verizon Wireless. Mm -hmm. um, so I was there during the whole transition, and uh, you know, selling cell phones and pagers to corporations is not exactly the easiest thing in the pl in, in the, on the planet. I'm sure. Um, so I really did cut my teeth with sales on it, with that. Um, and I just happened to know a girl uh, from school that, that got a job with Novartis Pharmaceuticals. And uh, they were looking for some new reps, and she recommended me. I had a couple interviews, and next thing I knew, I was uh, a, a pharmaceutical rep, which was uh, awesome. kind of a, it was a pretty cool experience, especially in the beginning. Yeah. Um, well, that's another good example yeah. of getting out to meet people and knowing people is a lot of what makes the world go around. So Not all what you know, it's who you know, right? <laughs> right, I know, huh? Well, very good. So uh, as you went through those years, I mean, because you were in sales roles for how long? Um, from 99 to, well, for, for those companies, uh, from 99 to 2000. 6, 2007, and specifically and in those... In at those some point, did it transition from the general pharmaceutical sales into what you had been looking toward? Um, well, the, Novartis was gracious enough, uh, gracious enough to pay for my MBA, which was nice. awesome. I was, on, I, was, you know, I was on the management track, and um, the industry changed. Mm -hmm. uh, things changed a lot with, within pharmaceuticals. So um, the the new laws and regulations really did change our ability and what we could do. It also changed the company's ability and what they could do for the doctors. Uh, so a lot of the a lot of the things and perks that we had, um, taking a doctor out to dinner, going golfing, you know, right. forming the relationship that you really need, was cut out. And uh, the companies needed to to find something else to do with the money. So they said, well, you know, one rep is good, three reps are better. <laughs> and so what they did is they oversaturated the market. So. You know, for me, used to being able to go see a doc um, and walk right into the back of his office and, you know, have him talk to me for a couple minutes and, you know, sign my sheet and I'll be on my way. It was a two-hour wait, right? I'd have to make a, an appointment a month and a half in advance. And um, it became extremely tedious. And the doctors that were my friends and the doctors that really knew me well started not having time for me because they had 10 reps that were coming in that day. So um, right. it, I, I started feeling more like a well-dressed UPS salesman <laughs> or uh, uh, you know I did a lot of lunches so I was a well just caterer I guess you could say <laughs> which it, which is fine and good but that was not what I really wanted to do so um, I wanted to get into the orthopedic market I, I wanted to get into something where you know it was a little more hands-on I was in the OR and I was actually really helping the doc rather than kind of selling a drug so um, the training with pharmaceuticals is absolutely amazing I mean they, they put you through you know months and months of actual training you'd go to New Jersey and um, tests and training and sales modules and mm -hmm. um, it, it was it was really really good experience I mean it was basically like going to college again for pharmaceuticals or sales so um, you got to learn the psychology behind it and whatnot but uh, I, I, I did want to do something more active and in the OR and, and, and really affect patients a little bit more 
So um, I got a job with uh, Johnson & Johnson to view my tech, which was uh, sports medicine, total hips, total knees, um, not any, sh any shoulders or anything like that, but I did a lot of ACLs and rotati rotator cuffs. Um, and again, the training was phenomenal, and the technical training for that job was phenomenal, so because you had to be able to basically go in and do surgery on your own. So we would actually have cadaver labs where we would actually do the surgeries on the cadavers and have to be proficient enough to be able to do it ourselves and then explain it back to the doctors and, wow. and, and, and direct the doctor. So it was, it was a really, really unbelievable experience. It was great training, and uh, I loved it a lot. It was, it was really nice. Wow, very cool. So what do you think, I mean, at what point did it start coming together to you, I wanna form a tissue bank? I mean, at what point did that start coming to fruition? What led you to that? Was it a co-op? Was it you know, people that you met that you wanted to work together with to make that happen? Or was it something that you just saw a need? Well, what happened there? Um, there came a point where you, know, you do an ACL surgery and, and half the ACL is the tissue or the replacement. So you can either do an autograft, which is from the same patient, or an allograft. Well, um, Phoenix is a pretty pretty high allograft uh, recipient city. And so a lot of the docs were using allograft. It's a much quicker procedure. Um, and there's a lot less comorbidities with the patient, so the patient doesn't have to um, have a lot of post-op pain from the recovery site. So um, I ended up hooking up with an allograft company and started selling some allografts. Because hmm. I was in the OR already. I was already doing you know, the hardware. Why not? bring in the, the, the soft tissue as well. And uh, it started becoming a pretty good business for me. And I started selling quite a few allograph, quite a few ACL graphs. So you um, saw the need. There definitely was a need. And there wasn't anything local. I mean, there were a couple local distributors, but there wasn't any local processor. Um, you know, the guys I was dealing with were in Montana. So it was, you know, you have to call in and, and see what they had and how to get it shipped out. And, um, it wasn't exactly the easiest thing, but to tell you the truth, starting a tissue bank was never really uh, on the top of my mind. Um, you know, one of the things that my, my wife always pushed me is that, you know, I, I gain, I, every job I had, I gained a lot of experience, uh, gained a lot of knowledge, but she's always pushing me to do something else and go further. You know, you're better than that. And, you know, your manager's not treating you right or things aren't going right with the company. So um, she was always pushing me to do something else. And uh, eventually I got approached by a, a couple guys that wanted to start a tissue bank. Um, they had a completely different idea, but laws and regulations kind of just narrowed them down to this. Mm. Um, so they had some funding behind them, uh, and they miraculously, miraculously got a recovery contract with the Oregon Procurement Organization, so a recovery agency, which is unheard of without actually having a tissue bank. So you might have to like describe a little bit about what a tissue bank is and does real quick here. Okay, so um, there's various forms of tissue banking. So uh, the first form of tissue banking is the actual recovery. So um, there are various organizations throughout the country called organ procurement organizations. So these are the organizations that come in when you donate your organs or your corneas or you know a anything specific. So these are the guys um, that follow the UNOS. So they recover the organs, and the next person on that list gets that organ. Well, those same organizations also recover musculoskeletal tissue, which is what we do. Uh, and musculoskeletal tissue is basically the long bones and the soft tissue, so the tendons and ligaments that, that, that come along with a donor. Um, and all this obviously is consented by the donor, the donor family. Um, there's tremendous screening, there's microbiology, serology. Um, everything is done within our power to make sure everything is safe before it even gets to us. Um, so that's the initial phase of tissue banking is the actual recovery. So they have these recovery teams that are on call 24 hours. They'll get a call from a the hospital, they'll get a call from a funeral home, they'll get a call from a hospice, and the teams will go in and do their recoveries. Uh, so that's the first phase of tissue banking. Uh, the second phase of tissue banking is what we do, is the processing. Um, we process that musculoskeletal tissue. Um, so what I process are cadaveric tissues from human recipients, um, mostly from bone. So we'll take the long bones and soft tissue, so we'll take a femur. And um, everybody here has heard of Peyton Manning, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Peyton Manning had uh, anterior cervical surgery. Uh, you know, kept them out for, for some time and uh, came back this year and had, he had an okay year. Um, but what, what we do is, uh, so he had anterior cervical fusion. So basically they, they fuse the vertebrae and what we make is the bone that actually goes between the vertebrae. So we actually make the bone that helps fuse those vertebrae together. Um, that's one of the things that we make. And we make that, uh, we've got in-house engineers. Um, we do uh, CNC, so it's all CAD design. Um, everything's done in-house, all our prototyping, all our fixturing, everything's done in-house. Um, and we can 
uh, make a piece of bone with their, with, if it's humanly possible, um, <laughs> within 0.25 millimeters of tolerance. And so wow. um, we, we usually have a specific footprint. So if it's for uh, cervical, we, it's a smaller footprint. For, if it's lumbar, we've got a larger footprint. Um, we've got specific teething patterns that we have to do, shapes and sizes. So um, that's one facet of our business. Another one is the sports medicine, so the, the soft tissue I was telling you guys about. Um, so anterior and posterior tibialis, uh, patellar tendons. Um, there's, there's a variety of tissues in the human body that can actually be used to replace uh, tendons or ligaments. And so for an ACL, that's probably the most popular one. Um, we process, package, and sterilize those products. Um, we do bone for dental applications. We do uh, skin for skin grafting. Um, we're in the process of releasing a medical device, um, which is demineralized bone matrix. It's uh, bone that has been processed or manipulated, minimally manipulated, uh, to expose the growth proteins. And those growth proteins actually help regenerate bone or stimulate new bone growth. It's called osteoinductivity. Um, so that's kind of what a tissue bank is in, in a nutshell. Um, and then the third fa phase of tissue banking is storage and distribution. So um, we do the storage and distribution as well, but there are also tissue banks that call themselves tissue banks that store the tissue and distribute when, they, when needed. Very good. That's the short version, guys. <laughs> <laughs> good stuff. Um, so you, ha you were a part of that initial tissue bank, and then you decided to form another one, Pinnacle Transplant Technologies. So what did you learn from the first time you were involved in this type of a company to the second one? What did you do differently the second time? Um, starting out just about everything. Um, like I mentioned, these guys wanted to start a tissue bank but had absolutely no idea what they were doing. Um, and I was the expert as a sales guy. <laughs> so um, we literally learned from the ground up. So it was trial by fire and we made a lot of mistakes. Um, and mistakes are good only if you can learn from them. Mm -hmm. So um, anywhere from the setup of the business to the people that we hired to looking at operating agreements. Um, <laughs> it really it really makes a difference but you know there was a lot of mistakes just in terms of the flow of the tissue bank um, hiring practices the way we manage money um, there, you know it was a startup it was a first time for all of us so uh, yeah. second time I around feeling I think you're I had not a, alone in that has yeah. anyone else had a company that kind of was your practice one <laughs> that happens but, I mean it wasn't it what by by any means it wasn't it was a bad successful, it wasn't it was a very successful yeah. company I mean we, we made it successful and, right and not I mean a lot but of hard work and perseverance but we learned a lot mm-hmm very good. So now you have the second one, and you guys have your own building and everything, right? You built it out. Yeah, we've got a uh, we built out a twenty five thousand square foot facility in North Phoenix. Um, we've got ten clean rooms, which is a fairly significant amount for for a tissue bank. Um, clean rooms, if you know what clean room, you know the the classes of clean rooms. Uh, actually, we have gi one giant clean room with ten clean rooms inside. So uh, nine of those clean rooms are class one thousand, and then one of those clean rooms is class one hundred. So just particulate per million. So uh, they're very very clean. Very good. So as you um, were forming this second company, I believe you had it started, and then you went ahead and joined one of the local accelerators. Is that how that worked out? One that, of the yeah, that's, that, that is kind of how it worked out. So, so tell us about that experience. Yeah, so w when we started, we kind of thought we knew everything, right? Because <laughs> um, I had the experience, and some of the people you know, left the other company to come with me, uh, and we had a couple savvy investors as well. So um, we thought that we were OK except that we started growing really quickly. Mm. Um, and when you grow really quickly, you've got to hire a lot of people really quickly, and then you've got to deal with the infrastructure and, yeah. and everything. And um, after about a year and a half, two years, we, we started realizing that um, we needed some help, that um, we each had our specialties, but we weren't necessarily fully equipped to um, strategically plan the business for the type of growth that we were experiencing. Um, and we kind of stumbled onto CEI. Um, Noah, my, my COO, his, his wife works for Gateway, and she mentioned to him one night, you know, I, there's, there's like an incubator, do you know what that is? At, at Gateway, you guys should probably check it out. And so that's exactly what we did. Very um, cool. It, it was, yeah, that's, you know, when, when you recognize you don't, you know what you don't know, or you that's don't know. That's pretty impressive, that's hard to do, because as entrepreneurs, we just figure we'll figure it out along the way, usually, you know, so. <laughs> yeah, well, when you get to crisis mode almost on a daily basis, uh, <laughs> It, you you, you kind of come time. to a, a realization that you might need some help. <laughs> right. So for those of, um, what is it like being a part of an incubator or an accelerator? Uh, I know there's a handful of them in Phoenix and they provide so much value and it's a win-win. They see a company like you that they know they can impact and help move to that next level. What's the actual experience of being a part of that organization like? 
Um, they're extremely, extremely welcoming. They're welcoming to new ideas. They're also welcoming to give you ideas. Um, I think the the number one takeaway from being part of an incubator is just experiencing the mentorship mm -hmm. because that's the reason why they've put this together. I mean, they've got experienced people that know what they're doing. They've been through this a lot. This is probably not the first time they're seeing something like what you're experiencing. So um, it really provided us some unbelievable support. Uh, we were also lucky, well, we had a vacancy. <coughs> and uh, the mm -hmm. vacancy was with the CEO position that, that was as of November. And um, they did a, a trial with a, a, a C-level, basically in-house or part-time CEO. So um, we were wow. actually able to really garnish the, the knowledge from that, and uh, the results have been absolutely phenomenal. Very um, cool. Anywhere from you know winning the uh, entrepreneurial Flynn grant to uh, venture madness to uh, deals with the ACA and uh, the city of Phoenix paying for some training. Um, one of the things that, that you know that an incubator can help you with is they're very connected within the local government, local legislature, uh, AZ Bio, and uh, Arizona Commerce Authority, and and we didn't really know any of that stuff existed. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been spending the last three years with our heads down, really concentrating on building the business and, and really concentrating on, on not failing. Um, and we weren't succeeding in spite of ourselves, but, but we, could, we knew we could do better. And um, it's nice to be able to lift your head up and, and recognize that there is a community out there that, that really does want to see you th thrive and wants to support you, um, especially in the biotech community here, because there's, there's a pretty big right. push. Very cool. So it was obviously has been a very positive experience. Um, at what stage do you think other entrepreneurs should be considering trying to connect with an incubator? We can let you drink some water. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I, th I think there's various stages. I, I think that we are, we are fairly unique in the fact that we were a cash flowing company. Um, mm -hmm. And at the time I, we started, I think we had 20 plus employees. So we were moving. But I think that um, if you've got a good strong idea and you've got a really good plan, or at least a solid plan, um, have an idea of where you want to go and, and, and what you want to do with it, but don't necessarily have the means or the facility, um, I think that's an opportune time to, to look at an incubator. Very good. All right. so. I'm curious, which came first, the name Pinnacle Transplant Technologies or the building on Pinnacle Peak Road? How did all that shake down? That was total coincidence. <laughs> really? Yeah. You're kidding. So, yeah, no, that was total coincidence. Um, really was. Uh, so when we, we organized, we wanted to uh, have a name for the company that was kind of relevant to our local landscape. You know, we live in a pretty unique area, and so I think that we wanted to really put our footprint and, and, and have our name represent where we come from a little bit. And mm -hmm. so. Pinnacle Peak um, yeah. was was where we brought it, we, where we got it from, and it just just so happens that the uh, the building that we that we built out happened to be on Pinnacle Peak Road. It was <laughs> absolute coincidence that was not planned. Um, Sounds like destiny. Well, there was another building on Williams, so it wouldn't be Williams transplant. So. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be quite the same. No, it's true. Um, so. Building a team as you grow through, you know, your first 10, 20, 30 employees like you have, building a team is an art that challenges many entrepreneurs because a lot of us are people with an idea and with a passion, but not necessarily, and even with a lot of business skills, but not necessarily with people management skills. So how did you overcome that? How did you get through such high growth so quickly and build a team that is able to support the business? Well, I think it, it all starts from the top. Um, I think that if you can all have, if, if the founders and the managers of the companies um, have the same strategic vision and can get along with each other, mm -hmm. um, even though they might disagree, they can all get along and, and really have an understanding of where they need the company to be. Um, because if the, it all starts there, because if there's infighting there and if, there, if there's not cohesiveness there, it, it, it just trickles down. That's true. So um, we were pretty lucky. Um, you know, Noah and I are, are very, very close. Uh, and we're, we're kind of yin and yang. So, you know, glass half empty, glass half full. Uh, <laughs> and both viewpoints are good. So um, we really even our, we even each other out. And then we were lucky enough to, to bring on, um, she's now our, con our controller. Uh, she was our first hire. And uh, that, that, that core really started um, the hiring practice. So um, we've made our mistakes and we've definitely had our bad apples. Um, we brought some people that followed us that I already knew so that definitely helped uh, yeah. in the development of our company. We had some industry experts that came along with us, 
and then um, we kind of we, we built out from there. So I guess that I mean Pretty having organic. a good core is it's, it's very organic. How do you think your employees would describe you? Um, I am pretty laid back until they want something. And then, uh, <laughs> then I'm pretty relentless. So um, yeah, they see me pacing around the office. They, they know that they better be on point because uh, so there's a deadline or something's due or people need to vote for us for Venture Madness. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently that worked out well. <laughs> Very good. Um, so I know as a part of your business model, you guys decided to focus in as a manufacturer and use distributors and whatnot and other people that aren't necessarily competitors but are peripherally do similar things to you have gone the route of building a sales team in house and whatnot. So what made you decide to stay on the side of just outsourcing that half of everything, sticking more into the distributor manufacturer or manufacturer side of it? So um, starting a business isn't cheap and a sales force is even less cheap. <laughs> That's true. Um, there's also a lot of liability involved. And um, you know, with with the old company, I did have some experience in doing some OEM manufacturing. We did have direct to market, um, but we we did a lot of OEM manufacturing. And the nice thing about you know manufacturing for a company is be, is that you know they're going to want the same thing the next month or the next month or the next month. So there was uh, there, there was proven sales and, and directed sales every single month. Um, and there was a need. I think one of the basis of, of our business plan was was to service these small to medium size spine, orthopedic, and dental companies that some of the really big companies um, wouldn't look at because their orders to them are too small, but to us, they're perfect. So right. uh, I'll put together, you know, 15 or 20 of these OEM companies and I'll have a pretty good sale, you know, pretty good sales. And um, they've already got the boots on the ground. They've already got the experience. So I, w I can train their sales force, um, but it also helps me. I mean, I like to do sales. I like to be out there. Uh, and it enables me to, to really have a good relationship with these distributors or these uh, these vendors, and um, it, it works out really nicely. Good. It sounds like that one just fell into place. It did. So you mentioned Venture Madness. Tell us a little bit about that experience, the process, the final event, the moment you were crowned champion. <laughs> so tell us about that experience. That was a, it was a, a pretty pretty cool experience. It was uh, fairly nerve wracking. Mm -hmm. um, to tell you the truth, we barely got the application on the deadline. Mm -hmm. um, Russ Yelton said, "Hey, you know this thing's coming out. You know I don't know if you guys are ready to do it just yet because we have had our heads down and, and nobody knew about us. Uh, and we did it by design. We didn't want any any press or any, any anything that could could point us out in a negative light. So I didn't think we were ready." So uh, Russ suggested, hey, you know, why don't you guys apply to this? Um, it's new, not exactly sure what, what it is, <laughs> but uh, it could be some good exposure. So, so we applied. Um, and the, the first couple of rounds were, were voting rounds and, um, you know, calling and Facebooking and emailing friends and family and uh, getting on my employees to, to do the same with, with their friends and family uh, got us for the, through the first couple of rounds because it was all online voting. I think the second round, it was a mixture of uh, panelist votes as well as, as the online voting. Um, and to tell you the truth, when I showed up at Talking Stick on that Wednesday night, I, I still didn't really know what was going to happen. And um, this is what, the final 16 at that point? Yeah, it was the final 16. Because there were 130? Like 100 and, I think it was like 120 companies. Companies like from all around the Southwest states yeah. that participated. Yeah, so when we got there, we, we set up our, our display booth um, and kind of had a, a social function. but. Um, we got the itinerary that night, so I kind of knew the basis and what it was going to be, and it, it was uh, it, it was uh, it was four pitches plus a question and answer session that was I guess impromptu at the end, but uh, you know two pitches a day Thursday and Friday, um, and between the first and second pitch on Thursday they took us all to the, the Diamondbacks spring training game, oh, fun. which was pretty cool, and uh, and this, the the sixth inning they announced the top the top eight. At the and game? At the game. Oh, wow. And then they proceeded to make us stand on the dugout and sing Take Me Out to the Ball Game. <laughs> <laughs> I think Jonathan's laughing over there. He had something to do with that. Yeah, so that was, it, was, it was fun. It was cool. It was different. Um, and one nice thing about it is that you're, you're getting to meet face-to-face -face a lot of these other entrepreneurs locally. Um, and the thing that I enjoyed about it is, like I said, this was my first time out. We really hadn't pitched ever. Uh, you know, I've talked to bankers here and there, and you know, I've, I've, I've given a business plan, but you know, standing in front of 100 or 300 people, right. um, giving your pitch is, is a little different. 
Um, but the, the thing that I, I gathered from it, that there, there really is a lot of genuine interest, not just in what I do, but what everybody else was doing, um, which was exciting to see. It was really cool. Um, just, you know, the opportunities and the ingenuity that, that people had to, to create these products um, was, okay. was very, very exciting. Yeah. Well, very good. Well, and congratulations on that win. That's Thank you. That's pretty cool. Um, so, do you, have a, do you have a favorite part of that experience? Was it, was it standing there singing, or was there... Anything that stood out to you? My voice is still sore from that. So. <laughs> right. um, I think that I really enjoyed the question and answer sessions. Um, and I think that I also liked to be able to explain to people that really didn't even know what we do, do exists. Right. Um, and people were surprised that they have this in their own backyard. Right. So um, it, it's nice to be able to teach somebody something new and show them something different. Right. Um, so that was a pretty good takeaway. Um, it was also really cool, you know, after I give a pitch to have, you know, people come up and hand me their business cards and I'd like to talk with you. You know, I'd like to do something with you in the future. It, it, it was a, a big pat on the back for us that a lot of the hard work that we had put in this company, it was really being realized. Very good. Yeah, that's awesome. So with your wisdom and experience this <laughs> far into life, what do you think are three essential traits for entrepreneurs? Um, number one is definitely perseverance because uh, nothing ever happens the first time. Um, and really, really believing in what you do. Um, I think that's what really, really helps me. Um, if I don't believe you know, in my core of what I'm doing, I don't put my full effort into it because you have to. If you're, if you're going to put yourself out there and be an entrepreneur, you really have to believe in what you do, whether it's a product or a service or whatnot. You, you have to believe that what you're doing is essential and it's the best that it is. Um, the last is to have good people around you. Mm -hmm. That's nobody can do it by themselves. So um, having good people around you and having them in the right positions. So uh, making sure that each position that you have uh, and their job descriptions match. <laughs> right. But, right. Uh, yeah, having having people and people that you can trust and people that have your same vision is absolutely important. So you're also saying they should come to Startup Grind to meet some people like that, right? Absolutely. Of course. <laughs> Very good. Um, and so what advice would you give to entrepreneurs who see a problem that they can solve but are still in those early stages of their business? Well, I think that uh, Phoenix and Arizona are trying to build that ecosystem that Jonathan was telling, talking about and, and yeah. uh, Michael was talking about, um, that there, there really is opportunity out there for, for people to, to spread their ideas a little bit. Um, and you know forums such as Venture Madness, but the incubators that, that we have locally, mm -hmm. um, if they don't necessarily take you on right away, they might give you some ideas and some direction. Um, you know, working with the Arizona Commerce Authority, there's lots of training grants and startup grants, and um, there, there's a lot of opportunity out there. But if you don't know it's there, it's not going to exist. It's true. So you know, just reaching out and, and finding people who, in the know that can point you in the right direction is probably the most important thing. Very good. I like that. Is there anything else I haven't asked you that you think is important? Um, there's there's you know, a lot on the donor side that, that I could talk about all night, but um, I, I think the most important thing that we do is uh, we provide uh, an outlet for the deceased and their families to really provide a good service and uh, create something that could be a, a tragedy and something terrible and fulfill someone else's need with it. So um, I, I think it's, it's really amazing that we can provide that service. I, I think it's, it's really awesome. That is cool. Everybody knows, you know, donate, but to see it happening and see it actually moving to the people and stuff, that really kind of sh brings it to a whole new level. Absolutely. Very cool. Good, good. All right. Well, the hard part's over. <laughs> so now we have a little tradition. It's called 21 Questions. And this is going to be rapid fire, you guys. So this is where you really get to know Gabe, all right? So he doesn't know what we're going to ask him. But these are just quick answers. So you can see what you have in common with him and whether or not you need to, you know, if you went to ASU, things like that. So we'll start with number one, Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Wine or beer? Uh, wine. Cats or dogs? Dogs. That was quick. <laughs> what color best represents your personality? Blue. Blue. All right. Va favorite vacation spot? Oh. Anywhere the beach. All right. Favorite hobby? Uh, sports. Sports. Well, speaking of which, favorite sport? Football. Okay. Favorite food? Oh, man. Steak. 
Steak? <laughs> you could say Mediterranean, I mean, you know. I grew up on that stuff. Oh, you did? <laughs> okay, well, there we go. Um, favorite movie or TV show? Um, favorite? Gosh, you, there's, so, there's so many. You're killing me here. <laughs> um, Bones? Forrest Gump. Just kidding. Forrest Gump. <laughs> All right. We'll go with that. Um, name two bands that you love. Jeez, this is rapid fire, huh? This is. I know. I don't even know any bands anymore. I just put on the put on, put on what, satellite what, what radio. Channel? What channel? I'm serious. Um, it's just, you know, the, the most recent ones. I, I guess, you know what? Uh, Beatles and Billy Joel. Oh, okay. My two favorites. Very good. By far. Any phobias? Not really. No? All right. Can you do any accents? No. <laughs> What is your most unusual skill? My most unusual skill? I don't know. I can bench press about 500 pounds. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, that's definitely rare. Um, weirdest thing you have ever eaten? Uh, live octopus. Ooh. What is the best compliment someone can give you? Be yourself. When was the last time you tried something new, and what was it? Something new. Venture madness. <laughs> <laughs> what profession, other than your own, would you like to attempt? I'd love to be a professional athlete. All right. What profession would you not be good at? Um, painting. Like the side of a house type, or the <laughs> or anything to do with paint. <laughs> okay. Um, best perks you ever had at a job? Uh, basically all the golf I could play. Nice. Um, if you could have one wish granted, what would it be? Uh, health and happiness for my family. Finally, last one. How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? <laughs> Can you do it? Have you never heard that? No. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Who's heard that? Who's heard that? Come on, help me out here. All right, we'll work on that later. Give him a hand, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Thank you, Gabe.